those of you who are joining us, we'll be starting in just a couple of minutes. We'll give some people some time to, to get online. All right, we gave our guests uh, permission to step away just for a minute. So we're gonna wait for them to jump on. Oh, here we are. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, hello everyone, and welcome to today's panel event, Voter Advocacy from Neighborhood to Nation. My name is Francis Oliana, Senior Manager of Design Operations at Coforma. Secretary on the AIJ National Board and Chair of the Design for Democracy Committee. I'm honored to be your host for today's conversation and I'm looking forward to facilitating your questions for our guests. I hope you're as excited to join us as we are to have you. 
Please say hello and introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're from and what brings you to joining us today. A little bit of housekeeping before we start. AIGA's Code of Conduct governs this and all AIGA events. AIGA is committed to providing a welcoming and inclusive environment. No harassment or abuse of any kind will be tolerated. You can read more about our Code of Conduct on the AIGA website. Next, I wanna share a little bit about AIGA's Design for Democracy initiative, which is one of our longest running modern initiatives. Since 1998, Design for Democracy has applied design tools and thinking to increase civic participation. By making interactions between our government and citizens more clear, easier, and trustworthy, engaged designers can help make democracy more accessible and sound. This initiative has included webinars and learning events like this, gallery and conference exhibitions, and the advocacy campaigns we've run each major election year. I will be dropping a link to this year's campaign in the chat in just a little bit. The AIGA Get Out the Vote campaign is a civic engagement initiative wielding the power of design to motivate American citizens to register and vote in US elections. The 2022 campaign invites AIGA members to advocate for civic engagement ahead of the November 8 elections. As part of this year's campaign, AIGA members are invited to submit posters to our Creative Commons Gallery to help educate and drive citizen particip participation in the midterm elections. Additionally, AIGA is partnering, partnering with Nonprofit Vote and the League of Women Voters to amplify our call for posters so nonprofits and election officials can have a greater access to resources to engage their communities. Original posters designed by AIGA members that are nonpartisan will be available for printing and public distribution, along with additional online resources that members can use in their local effort. Now on to, today, to today's panel. Today, we're honored to have with us three dedicated nonprofit leaders from local, regional, and national voter advocacy organizations to talk about their inspirations and pain points of working in voter advocacy, and why civic engagement and voting are so important, and how voter advocacy work can be community-centered and inclusive of people who are often marginalized in voter advocacy efforts. Erica Anthony is the co-founder and executive director of Cleveland Vote a nonpartisan org that works with community partners towards equitable civic engagement. She was also recently on the transition team to support Cleveland's new mayor, Justin Bibb. Diana Williams is the organizing manager of Texas Advocates for Justice, a nonpartisan organization focused on the criminal legal system. Diana advocates for people in the criminal justice system and life after parole for new voters. Maggie Bush is the programs and outreach director for the League of Women Voters for the US. Maggie writes about voter engagement and manages the league's nationwide voter engagement partnerships and programs. Welcome. So we're gonna start with um, a little hello and do you each wanna share a little bit more about yourself and what you do? Sure, I'll start. <laughs> I'm Diana Williams, uh, pronouns she, her, and I am with the organization Grassroots Leadership. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization where um, we fight for to end mass incarceration and also to stop deportation. Texas Advocates for Justice is a program, the criminal justice program under grassroots leadership, which I have a, a team of organizers. And what we do is to uh, build campaigns to transform uh, criminal justice policies that um, negatively affect the black and brown um, communities. I'm happy to go. Um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon as we are getting closer and closer to the election. Um, so again, as Francis said, my name is Erica Anthony. I have the honor of serving as the co-founder and the executive director of Cleveland Votes. Myself and our co-founder, uh, my sister in justice, Crystal Bryant and I co-founded the organization in 2014, um, just meeting Diana for the first time, but we already have a connection. So her and I actually started our work together um, here in Cleveland uh, because her and I were both working with individuals impacted by the criminal legal system. Um, separate jobs, but you know what brought us together was a coalition in our community. Um, and in that coalition, her and I co-chaired a committee where 
we were elevating important issues around community engagement and education. And pretty early on, we identified educating our community at large, as well as returning citizens about their right to vote. Um, obviously, every state's laws are different as it relates to who can vote, whether they're incarcerated or not, and what the process is when they return from prison. Um, we often say Ohio gets a lot wrong, but we actually make it pretty seamless for folks to re-register once they return from federal or state prison. Um, but that was not well known, we felt, in our community, um, both by just the, the lay person, our general population, as well as those returning from incarceration. That work uh, evolved to us uh, co-founding Cleveland Votes, uh, but we did start with this very niche specific population that we wanted to make sure had the tools, that, the resources, the education to understand why their civic participation is so important. Unfortunately, the county where Cleveland sits uh, incarcerates the highest percentage of folks to state prison out of all of our 88 counties in the state. We also receive the highest percentage of folks returning from incarceration. So we have a substantial amount of folks in our, in our region that have been impacted by the criminal legal system. And we, we started off by saying we want to aim to reactivate them. Um, and that is, has grown uh, to obviously other historically disenfranchised populations over the years. And I can talk more as we go through the questions. Awesome. Maggie? Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm Maggie Bush with the League of Women Voters National Headquarters. I'm in the DC area. Uh, I just want to thank AIGA for having this event. The League has been partnering with the AIGA for the last several election cycles. Um, your posters are well loved and used by our volunteers around the country. And I've had the chance to see a few of the posters that have already come in for this year. And um, just, you know, I'm always, as always, so inspired and moved by everyone's creativity, by the designer's work. Uh, the League of Women Voters was founded out of the women's suffrage movement over 100 years ago. Today, we have 750 community-based chapters all over the country, the vast majority of whom are entirely volunteer run. So um, we are also doing work to engage, um, you know, to engage high opportunity communities around the country. We believe we'll be serving over 6 million voters online in the, over the next few weeks. We're well on track to, to hit the same kind of numbers of voters we were seeing in 2020, which is exciting and a big challenge. Um, and we also have dedicated national programs around engaging first time eligible young voters. Um, we engage tens of thousands of new citizens in voter registration, as well as have a dedicated program um, where our community based chapters are reaching currently and recently incarcerated Americans to, to vote as well. So we all have that in common, which is exciting. Um, and uh, just really happy to be with everybody. So I think where where a lot of our, our our audience might be is they're they're wondering how they can get involved. If they've joined this call, you know they're definitely really interested in voter voter advocacy and probably haven't um, gotten to the point where they're you know leading or co-founding an organization. So um, what led you to your work in voter advocacy and how did you find yourself um, within you know kind of the passionate community of nonprofits? I will point that first to Diana. Yeah, great question. Um, why am I involved? Um, first of all, all elections matter. Um, a lot of people think that if it's not a presidential election, then you know, I may or may not vote. Uh, what we're doing during this campaign uh, season is to make sure that we have an educated voter. So we're really heavy on the education piece, educating those in the marginalized communities who are registered to vote. You know, voter registration in Harris County in the uh, marginalized communities have gone up over the years, but it doesn't do you it is justice if you're registered to vote, you go to the polls and you don't know who you're voting for or why you're voting for them. So what we have decided was that our main focus would be on the uh, education piece. Um, you know, we have um, toolkits with information on who's running in the local races as far as our county judge, uh, county commissioners, as far as the um, 
district judges, because all of those races matter. All of those races have an impact on what happens uh, in our community. So we're, you know, we're out there, whether we're door knocking or tabling or holding teach-ins, is to make sure that everybody knows who's on the ballot. And that way they can make their own independent best decision on who they want to vote for. So that's the gist of why we're involved. What about you, Maggie? How did you get involved in the League of Women Voters and get into the point where you're you're helping from a national level? Sure, uh, I started my work um, with the League early on in my 20s. I've been with the League for a long time, in fact. and. I mean, I will say 15 years ago, the uh, the voter advocacy space was a whole lot smaller than it is today, which is a good thing, right? That's a good, um, that we have a really crowded playing field and we trip over each other sometimes is a wonderful problem to have. And, um, you know, I have, I have had the opportunity to see firsthand pretty much every day in my job, um, the work that our volunteers, for the most part, volunteers are doing to engage voters and to, you know, to um, to help change lives. I get to hear those stories firsthand every day in my work um, and work with incredible partner organizations who are doing the work in their communities. Um, and I'm seeing a growing, um, um, a, a growing ability and interest across social justice movements and across, I think the nonprofit sector to connect civic engagement and voting and voting rights to so many of the other issues that um, Americans are fed up about and um, taking action on, particularly among women who, you know, uh, my organization tends to serve the most. So um, I'm just, you know, I think we're at a really critical point on lots of fronts, but exciting to, to be working with so many partners in the movement, including AIGA. Awesome. And then um, Erica, did you want to add anything Additionally, I mean, you, you co-founded your organization, but what kind of led you to that point? Because co-founding is a huge commitment, right? So how did you get inspired so much prior to that to keep kind of moving in, in, in the direction that you um, took? Yeah, definitely. You know, in some ways it was it was not a very intentional decision. I think it was rooted in just being in community and seeing a need. Um, Crystal, our co-founder and I are we're doers, right? So, you know, we we play a role in our community. Everyone has a, a part of the pizza, a part of the stew, and you know, we see a need and and not just in the reentry space or in the civic engagement space, but we show up in that way in, in many different ways. Um, but I think even before that, really to just acknowledge the ancestry of, of who I am and where I came from, um, leading by example, seeing my parents uh, and family members as a, as a young person being actively involved. I think our individual stories are really important in how we engage in this work because we have each have different, very different personal journeys and paths that, you know, just hearing from Diana and Maggie and myself, you know, how we got here. Um, and I think it's important to elevate to the community at large that we're not a monolith, right? I often say that, you know, I'm not always the first person that's gonna be at the protest. I'm kind of the policy wonky, geeky person. So I'll be there ready to receive those demands and figure out how to turn them into policy, right? But uh, it's not a either or, it's a both and. And it's understanding the gifts and the assets that you have and how can you most effectively contribute them. So, you know, we co-founded the organization, but I just stepped into the full-time role just this year. So we co-founded in 2014. Somehow magically we've been able to do this <laughs> without having a full-time executive director. Um, we had full-time staff, but, you know, it was sort of like braiding together, you know, sort of the community to make it happen. Um, but I think the intention for me to step into this role in a, in a full-time capacity really was necessitated by not just the pulse of our nation, but what's happening here in the city of Cleveland. Um, you reference, you know, we have a, a new mayor, first new mayor in the city of Cleveland um, in 16 years. Um, we've, we're seeing a lot of churning um, in some of the major institutions, both public and private. So it felt for me like this is a time to really um, not just commit, but maybe recommit to the city that I'm in 
because I was doing statewide work and, and figure out how Cleveland votes as part of the ecosystem could most effectively elevate, which is our tagline, educate, connect, and empower um, the tools that we're bringing, you know, more so as an intermediary and a backbone to support organizations that are on the front line. So we had this duality duality as a practitioner and a funder. So we provide grants to nonprofit organizations to help amplify and support their work in the community. So right now we're working with just about 30 nonprofits in our region uh, where we've provided almost $200,000 in funding because the stuff costs money. <laughs> you need staff, you need, you know, supplies, you need, you know, resources to help with operations. Um, and I think there's sometimes a gap in understanding how much it does actually cost. Um, and we're not a foundation by no means, but understanding that, you know, institutions like the league uh, who have obviously a longstanding um, position in our communities are critical because they they figured out the power of volunteers, but not everyone knows that, right? So we have to figure out, you know, how we balance both volunteer-driven organizations as well as those that have staff, uh, whether that's full-time or contract, um, because all of it is actually needed again because we're not we're not a monolith and we need diversity and in, in perspective. Awesome. Um, so I think sometimes whenever like if you've been involved with voter advocacy organizations and nonprofits, you know, especially um, because of some of the output that people see in voter advocacy, it's for a lot of designers, like that looks really cool, right? Um, I wanna kind of take a step back and make sure that like, we also know the work that y'all put into the, the everything that you guys do. So this is probably not the, the everyone's favorite question, but what do you feel are like the greatest pain points that you have in your work? I'll start with, um, Maggie on this one. Um, Erica was, you know, was was talking about the resource issue, which I think is absolutely a number one pain point. Um, even for a, a larger national organization, as I said, our, our affiliates are volunteer based, which means that our capacity, it greatly varies, <laughs> to say it politely, depending on where we are. Um, as does, you know, as does the, you know, what we're able to do and it, and it, um, it ebbs and flows from year to year, both because of, um, funding coming, going up and down, depending on whether it's a big election year or not, depending on what the political dynamics in the country are or not, uh, as well as our own leadership changes all the time. And so, um, you know, you're only as good as your last, um, kind of success sometimes in terms of where you can be encouraging more people to get involved and, and inspiring them to do so. So I think that's a main pain, major pain point. Um, I think the major pain point that, you know, the majority of Americans consistently are telling us and telling pollsters that they're really frustrated with the, the, um, the status of our democracy. They're worried, but they're also frustrated and they're not sure if it's really, um, going to withstand some of the challenges that we've seen in the last few years. And so how can we effectively do our work and encourage people to participate, even in a system that is um, where the deck is so stacked against groups of voters, major groups of voters in our country. Uh, so I think those are some of the, the pain points I'm thinking about as I approach the work. And then what about you, Diana? Yeah, I agree with Maggie. Um, as we're out and about doing our canvas work, it's difficult um, in this day and time to talk with the community and have them believe that voting is the thing to do if you want change, because they've seen so much of the adversity, you know, that has gone on with, um, with you know, the state of, of, of how we're living right now. So, um, you know, to have those down to earth conversations with the people in the community and trying to show them how their civic engagement involvement with um, the voting, um, you know, to not vote is not the thing to do, but to let your voice be heard. Uh, that's a difficult conversation to have with some people sometimes. And, um, you know, but what we do is just, we just continue to um, engage 
with the community and just to show them uh, that, you know, this is what we really need to do. We need to let our voices be heard and we need to do that through um, the vote to get out and vote. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? You had kind of mentioned some of the pain points earlier, but Erica, did you have anything else specifically that you wanted to, to add to the conversation there? Yeah, I think just a few and, and really just building on uh, Maggie and Diana's comments, uh, the polarization has made it incredibly challenging. Um, and I think for us that are doing this and living, breathing this every day, you know, it's, we, we also have to find our own inspiration. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to speak for Maggie and Diana, but I know that's how we feel some days. Um, but, you know, we conducted some research last year uh, uh, with a local think tank policy matters and a national firm hit strategies to essentially examine the, the civic behavior and motivation or lack thereof of Clevelanders. And one of the top uh, headlines or themes from that research uh, indicated that Clevelanders specifically lack trust in the individuals that have the power to affect change. So whether that's government or elected officials. And I think, you know, what we took away from that is one, we have to lean into the, the truths that our community members hold. Um, and we, we can't shy away from that. We have to acknowledge that and we have to affirm that because it's their truth. Um, and at the same time, we have to encourage them to see, you know, to, to sort of translate in some ways what democracy looks like beyond elections and how democracy shows up in their daily life. Um, and that's not always as clear for folks. Um, you know, again, I, I acknowledge that like it's a privilege to be in this role and to have the luxury to, to do this work every day and think about it and, and, and think about it and strategize around it. Um, but when we think about what most, most persons in our community are, are holding, work, family responsibilities, caregiving, you know, not everyone's waking up listening to like whatever podcast <laughs> that's talking about democracy and voting. Um, so, you know, thinking about what's happening in your community that feeds into the civic participation, right? So I'll just use examples from Cleveland. We, we have a, a set of organizers and activists in our community that are um, advocating for participatory budgeting um, for our community to adopt that as a practice uh, with our ARPA, our American Rescue Act dollars, that a percentage of those dollars would be essentially afforded to the community to decide how to use. That's one example. Um, we here in the city of Cleveland were not allowed public comment by residents in 2021, if you can believe that. And there were uh, there was a coalition that advocated to make it possible for us to be able to provide public comment that we should be able at the city council level engage with our elected officials um, in a dialogue, obviously, on issues that are important to us. Uh, folks can look at, you know, local boards or commissions, you know, even if they're not a member, but, you know, just tuning in uh, to those meetings to have an understanding of what is being discussed, what issues or, or legislation or policies are our local effect, uh, elected officials um, engaging in dialogue around. Um, and I know not everyone has digital access, so just like, naming that as a barrier, but you know, for those that do, many, many of these institutions are still making those type of meetings available virtually um, as a result of the pandemic. So I think being able to provide folks really tangible examples of how one, they can activate themselves in, in local community and civic participation, but also how does that show up, whether we're talking about housing, education, birth rates, you know, the, the health of, of, of a community, all of that feeds into, you know, why someone should be motivated to turn up to the polls. Yeah, so um, we're going to want to make sure that I'm inviting the, the audience to add questions. Um, if they do have questions, um, please add them to the Q&A. Um, there's a little Q&A button that you can uh, click in and add those to the conversation, and we'll ask those um, in a bit. Um, so now that we were talking about pain points, you did kind of touch on like, we have to find your own inspiration. Um, can you guys share something that like something inspiring recently, <laughs> because there's so much stuff going on right now, something inspiring recently that like keep, has kept you motivated or really like um, empowered kind of you for, for the work that you've been doing like this year specifically? I'll go. Okay. Um, <laughs> our uh, our league here in DC it, uh, does work um, with the with the 
Bureau of Prisons as well as the, the jails here in DC if people are federally, um, from, you know, have a federal charge and they're from the DC area because DC is not a state, um, those individuals get sent all over the country, um, which is an incredibly complex process of trying to reach out to people uh, after the fact to, to engage them as voters. Um, but our DC uh, local leader was telling me that she was trying all the ways she could think of um, to help engage recently returned folks in voting, people who had come back to, to live in, in the District of Columbia after being incarcerated somewhere else in the country. And she had the idea to um, find out who was providing ankle monitors um, at where required to individuals and to, to befriend that person. And she did it. And I just, I imagine this is a very tenacious volunteer. I imagine her chasing down a guy and uh, finding, and that's exactly what she did and befriending him. And she ended up talking him into texting every single person that he was serving um, through the through the ankle monitoring service uh, and and helping helping get them the voting information that they needed and it's resulted in lots of people calling our league there in DC asking for help uh, pro, uh, going through the process and asking questions and it's even gotten some of the people to um, to to decide they want to volunteer and and help other people get engaged in voting and so anytime I'm feeling frustrated I think about Kathy. Um, being creative. Yeah, you kind of have to. How about you? Uh, how about you, Diana? Yeah, that's great. Um, you know, here in Harris County, uh, we've got in any given day, 9,000 plus people who are um, uh, incarcerated. Um, 8,000 or so are on pretrial um, detention. And so those people are, you know, eligible um, to be registered to vote. So we have advocacy groups here in Harris County who are going into the jail, the local jails, and actually registering those folks uh, to vote. Um, and then we are one of a couple, two or three um, jails, large jails, who actually have polling locations. Uh, inside the jail. So that's the inspiration right there because those people have for so long been disenfranchised because they've been incarcerated. But many of them are there incarcerated but have not been you know, convicted of anything. They haven't um, you know, gone to trial. They're just sitting there waiting and they've been eligible to vote. So that's some of the work that uh, inspires me, you know, to keep doing what I'm doing. I even had a conversation a couple of days ago with uh, a young man and we were just, it was just a ca casual conversation. And he was telling me that, you know, he was uh, formerly incarcerated and had just gotten off of uh, parole. I said, well, are you registered to vote? Well, I can't vote because I have a felon. I'm like, well, yes, you can. <laughs> you know, you're no longer on parole or probation. You can register. And to see his eyes light up, like, I really can? I'm like, yes, you can, you know. So those type of instances that, you know, people just don't know. And that's what, you know, I feel like we as advocates, uh, should be doing and are doing is educating, you know, the people on what their rights are. So, yeah. And how about you, Erica? Yeah, just about um, two, three weeks ago, I had an opportunity to spend time with uh, some high school students here uh, through Cleveland Metropolitan School District. Uh, there's a teacher that facilitates a Civics 2.0 class. Uh, and have worked with her a, a couple of times over the years in different occasions, but understanding that, you know, civics is no longer mandated in most uh, school districts uh, presently, uh, it's just a kudos to her for, you know, facilitating and, and getting our district here to have this class. Um, it's not the entire district, it's, you know, a percentage of the students, but we, myself and a number of other partners were invited in to facilitate dialogue with the students to essentially help them create a campaign that would engage their fellow classmates, right? So it's like, cool, 
y'all are in this civics 2.0 class, you know, clearly you're motivated and engaged, you know, what can we do to collectively to create some type of campaign that would entice perhaps, you know, your fellow classmates to come in and, you know, really just, you know, being a facilitator, right? Letting them uh, allow their creative juices to get flowing. Um, they quickly told me that I couldn't use words like lit, um, which I feel like is still an appropriate term to use, but apparently not. Um, they also told me that Snapchat is not as cool anymore. Clearly I'm out the game. <laughs> so I learned a lot, um, but really what was most important is just hearing their, or listening to them generate ideas, you know, and, and really talk about, I think I posed a question to them, something of the sort of like, what are your, what are your most pressing issues or what are the most pressing issues that you're facing? Um, in some ways, disheartening. Um, mental health came up a ton. Suicide came up a ton. Um, but also there were kids like wealth distribution and disparity, you know, economy or, you know, economics and housing disenfranchisement, right? And, and really starting that conversation for them to just talk about the issues that they're thinking about and talking about, and then translating that into you know, then, okay, so how do we use this then to engage in some type of social media campaign with your fellow classmates? Um, and I think just, you know, planting those seeds, even for some of the students who were non-voting age, there were a few that were 17, um, but majority were non-voting age, um, just to get their, their creative juices flowing and, and start to, you know, ingrain that as a practice um, so that when they are a voting age, they can continue to engage and, and motivate others to engage. We do have a question um, here in the chat. Uh, what are the most effective ways for us as individual citizens to advocate for voter access and education in our local communities? You wanna take that one? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, again, understanding with the asterisks that obviously every state uh, looks different. <laughs> uh, so not knowing where the, the question, wh which state the person is from. Um, I think first and foremost is just to look and see who's doing the work. Um, you know, many communities, larger communities have um, institutions like the league. Um, there are other national organizations. So starting maybe at the top, thinking about some of the national organizations that may have a chapter in your region um, or just a a simple Google search to see, you know, which voter and or civic motor, um, uh, voter uh, engagement organizations are in your community. And just starting to do a little bit of research for yourself and see, you know, I always come from the standpoint, let's work smarter, not harder. Um, so if there is an institution in your region that, you know, is advocating already, has a policy agenda, ACLU is another one that, you know, tends to be in some of the larger cities, um, reach out to them, you know, and see, hey, you know, is there a bill, you know, in your state house? that, um, you know, might need some added capacity? Um, are you looking for volunteers? You know, I think, again, COVID has made available different type of volunteer opportunities that weren't available before. So having more virtual volunteer opportunities by doing texting from home or phone banking from home, as well as, you know, of course, in a communal setting as well. Um, but just, yeah, I think just doing a local scan um, and then also seeing if there's any gaps, you know, that's what Crystal and I did. You know, we didn't just say, oh, we're going to create this organization without doing our due diligence. Um, so it's not always creating, but it could be forming alliance or partnership, you know, and seeing if, if there's a, an asset that you bring from a skill set that could be additive to one of those organizations. I totally agree uh, with what Erica is saying. You know, chances are there is an organization uh, or hopefully several in your community who are doing voter engagement that you can get involved with. Um, also, I would say on the immediate front, you can be a source of good and trusted information to the people in your lives as a first start, uh, as a first step. So going into this election, there are a lot of changes. Voting looks different than it did maybe in 2020 when we all voted in different ways, most of us, uh, because of the pandemic, many states have again changed how voting is working and people don't know and aren't really thinking about that yet, right? So um, find a resource that you trust, whether it's through one of our organizations um, or your local election official and be a source of good, trustworthy information. Um, you can also make sure you have handy the election protection hotline, which I'll put, I'll put it in the chat in a second. Um, which is a consortium of many, many of our organizations locally and across the country where there are people staffing those lines every day 
uh, all day during the voting season in multiple languages and can give voters real time help if they need it. Um, and then I, finally, I would say if something happens or you know of something where you think somebody's voting rights weren't were not um, were not granted correctly, or you think a polling place was not accessible, or there were issues um, or things that you want to you know that you believe need to be done differently, um, contact your local officials. Officials, you know, are there because they represent us, and so um, absolutely show up to those. Um, show up to those meetings where officials are, are making decisions and talking, let them know what you think, good or bad, about what you're experiencing, whether it's on voting rights or anything else, uh, any of the other issues that we've talked about, um, and, you know, really help be a voice for others. Yeah, that's great. I, I can't say enough about educating yourself first. Um, you know, the more you know, you can spread that on to your, your, your family, your friends. Um, and then just build a, you know, coalition uh, of yourselves. League of Women Voters, they're everywhere. Uh, I lean on them a lot here in Harris County. Um, you know, awesome work. We collaborate. Um, but like Erica said, and Maggie as well, you Google search, you know, do your research. There are just tons of organizations that, um, you know, continuously do voter work, whether or not it's actually at election time or just, you know, everyday um, voter registration. So, yeah, so I think key is education, educating yourself uh, first. Yeah, I think one of the things, too, that designers, uh, one of the, the big talents that you have or, or that we're taught in school is really how to take a lot of complex information and distill it so that it is almost like instantly understood or at least better understood. And I think with voting and a lot of the, the policies and even some of the campaigns out there, there's a lot of information that needs to be kind of, you know, honed down to what's actually real and and and, and basically more precise so people know what they are voting for. Um, Francis, can I just mention one more thing just on the yeah. point you just made? Um, you're reminding me that uh, our actually uh, consultant, our creative consultant, is an AIG member uh, here in Cleveland. And um, in 2020, when we were starting our census work, one of the things that we wanted to do was really figure out, you know, what are the the, the methods in which we're going to communicate again with the midst of the pandemic, understanding that we were compromise in a lot of ways of, of, you know, our strategies were compromised, you know, because of the inability to be in physical proximation. Um, one of the one of the strategies that she helped us create was a set of infographics. Um, and we held workshops um, essentially with our partners, you know, representing different neighborhoods, different, you know, just different members of our community to ensure that we were getting diverse thought and, you know, what would be an infographic or a set of infra infographics ultimately that will help you, you know, partner A, communicate with the audience or the, the communities that you're engaging. Um, and to your, to your point, you know, having, having that thought partner, um, a design thought partner, and just the visualization of like how that information was to be communicated. I mean, there's no way that we could have ever <laughs> done that on our own. So um, I think just co-signing on like, you know, bringing your talents, right, uh, to local nonprofits. So many, uh, you know, us included, we don't have, we have now some full-time staff capacity, but many, many organizations in our space do not have that in-house capacity. Um, and, 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 and if you're able, you know, outside of your full time work to lend that or if they have the resources to contract like we did, um, it's a it's an incredible resource to bring. Um, and, and I think ultimately the community was really pleased and appreciative that we were able to bring this resource to them uh, through our designer um, and ultimately create the set of infographics for our community. So when you're talking about that, I mean, that is uh, depending on who it is that you're able to get involved, right? I think one of the things about kind of co-creation and community-centered engagement and inclusivity and voter advocacy efforts also means like people being able to, to see themselves in who they're speaking to, but also kind of the opposite of way, opposite way. How might we include more marginalized community leaders in getting involved in the actual advocacy work? I'm gonna pick on you first this time, Diana. 
Well, our uh, our base members are um, actually those who are returning citizens or formerly incarcerated in their families, and uh, they lead the work, you know, that they do uh, as far as building campaigns. Um, and right now, they're the ones um, on our team that are out doing the voter education and voter engagement uh, work as well. So uh, they're really involved in, because, you know, the people who are most effective about any matter are those that have been most effective, uh, affected, you know, about any um, situation. So we use their uh, stories, they tell their stories in order to, um, to express, you know, their journey and what they're, what they're going through. So that's, uh, that's, you know, that they're our base. Um, they're the ones who are will go up to commissioners court, city council, and speak on you know issues that negatively affect um, you know them and their community. So you know they're the driving force of the work that we do. Maggie, you're very good. Yeah, happy to hop in. Um, you know, I think it's. The first thing that popped in my head when you asked the question is I thought of Brian Stevenson's um, book, Just Mercy, where he talks about being proximate. Um, you know, there's no way that we could lead with authenticity if we weren't proximate to the members of our community that we know have been historically and presently oppressed and suppressed uh, from having equitable access to the ballot and, and other rights. Um, so we have to we have to balance that in understanding that we as an organization, you know, work grass tops to grassroots and everyone in between. Um, I think the way that our vehicle, our, our, our most effective vehicle uh, to ensure that we're maintaining that, um, you know, sort of efficacy and how we're delivering our work is through the partnerships of folk, the folks that we're providing grants to um, and making sure that we're intentional in how we are seeking and how we're inviting folks to even receive grants. Um, so really challenging a lot of the norms of traditional grant making and making sure that our processes um, are, you know, hopefully uh, less burdensome than some of the other grant making processes and, you know, doing things like going to community and hosting sessions just to learn about our grant making, making ourselves available, you know, for technical assistance um, and, you know, continuing to make sure that folks um, can answer questions or ask questions and that the, the process is very simple. Um, but then we also, once we select our grantee cohort, we host what we call our community of practice, right? So it's not just the investment of our resources, um, but it's the investment of our of our time um, and the collective time um, as both Maggie and Diana have elevated, you know, we're only as good as, as the sum, right? And we we don't claim to be experts. We're active learners uh, with community. So being in community of practice uh, with our grantees is a, a safe space to share information, vent sometimes, <laughs> um, but learn from fellow democracy builders in the region and, you know, figuring out how there may be collaborative opportunities or just, you know, having someone to bounce some ideas off of. And if you're sort of stuck on, you know, a particular engagement or, or, or a strategy that you're working on. Um, but I think first and foremost, it's about listening and being proximate uh, to the community that you're seeking to serve. And what about you, Maggie? Um, I would just, you know, quickly add, I think, if, you know, going back to the original question of how do we get more people to want to be involved? I think, you know, I'm not seeing a lack of um, Americans passionate about needing to change things and speak up about that in a new, with a new willingness, like on especially women um, over the last few years. I do think though, as organizations, if we're working to engage advocates, I mean, the honest truth is we have to make it easy and accessible for people um, to, to take that action, whatever the action is. And we have to be really explicit about what it is we're asking them to do and how, and helping, helping make that, um, uh, a seamless process for them. And that's easier said than done a lot of the time. Um, and, you know, we don't get quick wins necessarily or see the immediate output of our actions. Um, so trying to make sure that we're always um, sharing back with people what their impact was, even if it was a, a first step kind of impact. Um, thank you for showing up at this event because it opened the door for 
X, Y, Z, you know, forward momentum on our issue. Um, so I do think uh, we, we as nonprofit leaders have to have to con continuously improve um, our own game in terms of, of what, what opportunities we are giving activists and recognizing um, that activists, especially those from most impacted communities on voting rights or other issues have, you know, very limited time, you know, lots of things going on, limited ability potentially to, um, you know, to, to take to take lengthy part in what you're doing. So making it again, bite size and doable for them, keeping them always centered um, and asking them and listening to Erica's point, um, listening to how best they can and want to get involved and then planning your programs accordingly. So uh, one of you had mentioned something about kind of like getting involved and in, getting involved in a very authentic way. I think um, sometimes I, especially kind of in the designer community, some of the some of the designers who have more time to volunteer are also probably coming from a place of privilege, but they want to help out. Like how would you encourage them to get involved? Like what would be the first steps for them to get involved in your organization specifically, right? Um, from a place of authenticity and where they also feel like safe kind of volunteering their their time and their effort and their and their thinking. Any thoughts on that? I mean, I would say if you're coming from a place of privilege, it might be opening your wallet to an organization that that you trust, right? Um, I think we saw this debate in the in the repro rights community a lot uh, during the last few months with the decision. It wasn't about you know starting a new abortion rights network or organization. It was about finding the mutual aid organizations and the local abortion funds um, if you were angry about that decision and if you had the means to support it and support the incredible important community work that was already likely happening. Um, and so if you are coming from a place of privilege, I think often it's realizing that that's your vantage point and realizing what you can contribute. And it may be that there's already an incredible lo local organization doing the work that needs your support. Um, or potentially as a volunteer or a, or a board member who can provide some sort of expertise and connections, et cetera. But I'd love to hear from my colleagues too on this. I agree. Um, funding and resources. Um, we've got a program um, in our criminal justice um, project called Participatory Defense. And it's where we as uh, advocates will go into the courtrooms with the families and or the defendants and help them through the uh, criminal justice system, help them understand what's going on, uh, help them understand you know, what their attorneys are doing, what the major players in the uh, courtrooms are doing. And so often when um, you know, these people bail out, some of them don't have a place to go you know, and um, uh, once they're out, or you know they're they're looking for a job, so they need funds to help them, you know, look for a job and get you know back on their feet. So um, you know the funding as far as mutual aid, um, you know, for these uh, participants uh, would be huge, you know, um, because it's expensive to go back and forth to the courtrooms with you know Uber and and parking and things like that. So. You know, people who are, um, you know, able to funding is, is you know, it would do the world for, um, you know, a lot of the programs that we have going on is, you know, to get help with uh, funding for resources. Cosign, cosign, cosign. Um, and, you know, I think going back to one of our previous questions and responses, there, there has to be an effort on your side also um, in doing doing some due diligence and researching what's happening in your community already. Um, you know, if I had a dime for every email I received or inquiry, like, what should I do? <laughs> it's like, how do I solve democracy, Erica? Um, you know, I could probably like sustain clean votes indefinitely. Um, so, you know, try not to put more labor uh, on the organizations that are already putting a lot of labor into this work. Um, you know, do a little bit of homework. You know, I'm, I'm more 
likely to, you know, I'm always going to respond because that's, that's just how my mama and daddy raised me <laughs> out of respect. I'm going to respond, but I'm more eager to respond when someone's like, hey, I saw on your website or I saw on your social media that da 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 you know, how can I plug in? Or, you know, I bring this talent, this asset, this thing, you know, I would love to lend my services this way. Or we have a local music ensemble who, um, you know, they're like, we're musicians, you know, like we want to help, but how we can help is we have pop-up concerts around the city and we want to donate our tips to you, right? Like in a very thoughtful way. Um, So, you know, it's like, one recognizing what your what your gifts are and your assets and and what you could bring to an organization or, or a set of organizations, but then do a little bit of homework um, and at least offer a suggestion. Again, you know, through dialogue, maybe that'll um, evolve. But uh, just be conscious of the labor that many of us are bearing um, in this work, and and not to have us be like the fixer for you <laughs> and trying to figure out what to do. Wonderful. So we are at about six minutes uh, left, and I want to make sure that you guys get a chance to, y'all, sorry, all three of you, have a chance to share uh, some final thoughts. I do want to note, um, if all of you who are in attendance um, don't know uh, what is really, uh, what's on your ballot, there are a lot of ways to find out, but all 435 seats in the House of Representatives and 35 of the 100 seats in the Senate are being contested. And there's a lot of governor races going on right now. So please go do that research that we uh, have been advocating for. Um, So I wanna kind of recap some of the things that y'all have said, do your due diligence, Um, be very thoughtful in the use of your skills and talents, Um, volunteer, be authentic, um, add your diversity to the thought that's going on and the work that's going on. And um, I'm going to leave this last five minutes to you three. How would you like to, what's, what are some of your final words to inspire the, the team out there, the, those that are attending, the team? I just always assume everybody's a team. Um, the, those attending um, who have, have kind of stuck through this, this entire conversation and those that are going to be watching this after. Um, you want to go first, Maggie? Sure. I would just say, you know, you are the most important um, and most reliable person in people's lives to talk about the importance of our democracy and about voting. So this is like time to think about your niece or nephew who is newly eligible to vote or your friend who moved or your coworker um, who who maybe hasn't voted in a while or, or ever. And, and, and help them facilitate the process that we, we just consistently see that that personal support um, and personal asking and sharing why it matters to you and why you hope it matters to them is, is just absolutely key. It's, it's more important than any of the other big voting initiatives that, um, that we see around us at this time of year. So um, please think of you know, three people you can ask in the next week if they've started to make their plan yet. Yeah, for sure. Um, just to show, um, you know, passion about the work. Uh, you know, we are as advocates, we are of service, you know, to the communities that we uh, engage with, and our um, passion shows in the work, you know, that we do. Um, taking the time out to, you know, talk to that elderly uh, lady down the street and and listen listen, listen to her concerns, and then, you know, offer uh, responses to her family members, you know, taking the time to talk to the family about, you know, um, not only the elections and what's on the ballot and the importance of voting, but just to listen with, you know, uh, attentive ears on everyday things that are going on, you know, in people's lives. Uh, Because you never know who you impact uh, on any given day, you know, and the key is just to be, you know, to be compassionate, compassionate and, uh, you know, take your time to um, to listen to people and and, you know, and then just hope that, you know, the words that you share with them have some sort of impact on, you know, some of the decisions that they may make in their own lives. Awesome. Nerica? 
Yeah, so I would start with encouraging uh, each of the, the team members here <laughs> to uh, think about, you know, your own story. Um, you know, as Maggie and Diana just elevated at the end of the day, you know, you have to be motivated and driven, right? And there's probably an issue or a set of issues that um, led you to this webinar today and, and continue to have you activated lead with that story. Um, you know, we can talk about statistics, we can talk about research, and there's a time and place for those um, forms of data and information, and they are incredibly important. Um, but when you're connecting with people, you know, the thing that they remember is the story. Um, so talking to, um, as Mackie said, your niece or nephew, you know, perhaps as new voters or newly budded vote voters about why it's important to you. Um, secondly, I would say, you know, thinking about just checking out your Board of Election website, you know, when's the last time you went to your Board of Elections website, making sure that you're familiar with it so that if you are uh, engaging with folks in your family and your friend network, that you can properly direct them to where they can find their information. Um, thirdly, I would say make a voter plan and then share that plan with that network of folks, uh, as Maggie was elevating a moment ago. So every state is different, but, you know, generally it's, you know, vote early, vote by mail or vote in person on election day. Um, and really encouraging folks to, you know, think about that, you know, we get busy, so not relying upon election day only. Um, and then a plug for, you know, one remaining civic holiday, I think, in our cycle, which is vote early day, which is October 28th. Um, that may be, you know, just like a one time way that you can get involved with a local organization that might be activating and encouraging folks to vote early. Um, we say here in Cleveland, you know, you can get in and out in like three minutes if you go down to the Board of Elections on a Tuesday before Election Day, you know. Um, so just trying to trying to show the ease. Um, and then I would say lastly, you know, one of our hashtags that we often elevate is there is joy in democracy. Um, I know that's hard to believe some days, uh, some minutes, some moments, <laughs> but um, you know, I, I think each of us have elevated how we stay inspired, how we stay encouraged um, through the communities that we serve and just celebrating that. You know, there are folks out here working, grinding, really trying to realize this, this dream of what a democracy can be. And we have to celebrate that and we have to appreciate that in the midst of the chaos. Um, so just, you know, to also bring some fun and levity into this is also a great way to stay engaged. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. I think one of the things that designers love doing is to design solutions for stuff. And if there's any motivation to get involved in democracy is there's so many things to fix. Kind of something like what you said about Cleveland earlier today. Um, thank you guys so much for your time. It's just been like super inspirational for me. I kind of want to print out a bunch of voting information and going around my apartments and putting it on every door. So we'll see if that happens. But thank you so much for your time. I think this has been really inspiring, um, not just for this group that as in, in this chat, but we have a lot of people on LinkedIn and YouTube watching and who will be watching in this after. So really appreciate all the work that you do. I'm sure everybody um, attending also does. And um, thank you so much for uh, volunteering your time for this. I and mean, really appreciate it and hope you guys have a really fruitful, stress-free October. Um, and I hope you get some volunteers out of this too. So thank you guys so much for your time.